My real name is Joseph Maldonado, M-A-L-D-O-N-A-D-O. -O. Uh, the world calls me Joe Exotic. <laughs> I'm pretty much pretty much comfortable with Joe Exotic. It's like I drive down the interstate and everybody's like, Joe Exotic! But uh, I am the entertainer here. I am the tiger trainer. I am the pizza cook. I am the burger cook. Uh, I do most of uh, social marketing and I love every bit of what I do. And you were talking earlier that you got into this after the death of your brother. Tell me a little bit about that. Right. Uh, the original park was built in memory of my brother. Uh, we owned a pet store in six, uh, for 16 years in Arlington, Texas. And he got killed by a drunk driver. And when I signed the papers to shut his life support machine off and donate his organs, I, I promised him he just wouldn't be another statistic. So uh, me and my mom and dad started this, uh, you know, whole thing in 1998. And, uh, you know, with the help of, of other corporations taking over and, and bigger money and everything else, it, it's a world famous place. I couldn't be prouder. Why tigers? You know, I actually started with one deer. <laughs> and my very first tiger uh, call I ever got was in Ardmore, Oklahoma. And I rescued two tigers in 1999, and from then on, I just somehow became the Tiger King guy, you know? But we have 227 of them out on this, on this facility, and they're just so misrepresented in the world. I mean, you saw me interact with them. I, I, I would rather be in a cage with a tiger than killed by a drunk driver the way my brother was. What is it like, how do you learn, it's funny that you kind of fell into this by accident, the tiger part. So how do you learn to take care of an exotic animal like that? Well, you know, uh, if I wouldn't have had 16 years of, of experience in an exotic pet store business and growing up bringing white mice home from Catholic school during the summertime, you know, and, and animals my entire life, I, I probably wouldn't be as knowledgeable as I am, but you know, I, over the years, I've, I've been doing this over 32 years now, and over the years, you know, I've had colleagues such as Steve Irwin help me out uh, and, and everything. So I've learned, and my goal in life is to educate people that you never stop learning. I don't know everything. I learn something new every day, and that is the purpose of my show. That's the purpose of of letting people interact with animals is before you go buy one, uh, let's learn how to take care of it and make sure you know how. It, it, you know, it's no different than before you have that child, let's make sure that you can, for 18 years plus, take care of it because it's a lifetime commitment. And, right. and that's one of my goals. Right. Well, you know, this kind of brings up, <laughs> you know, Oklahoma has some of the most lax, lax laws and regulations exotic animals in Correct. the country. You know, how has that affected how you do business here? Do you know why we have the most exotic, uh, relaxed laws in Oklahoma? I sued the state of Oklahoma in 2006. Okay, uh, understand one thing. The, the state, any state or government, in order to sell or regulate an animal, they own that animal. And in 1952, the state of Oklahoma had a law that said they owned all wildlife. And if they want to permit me or take uh, my rights away to own private property, uh, which is my constitutional right in this country, uh, they can pay to take care of it. Okay, so I sued them for three hundred eighty thousand dollars for boarding their animals. So if there's a deer on your property and you can't hunt it, keep it as a pet, or anything else without a permit. The state of Oklahoma should owe you for boarding that animal. Okay? So they settled out of court for $20,000 and got rid of all exotic animal laws in 2006. It was part of our agreement. And I am very proud that Oklahoma has stood up to the animal rights people. I'm very proud to, that the state of Oklahoma politician uh, say, you know, we have a right. There, there is not an exotic animal emergency in this country. Uh, there is not a tiger emergency in this country. And it is, and that is why I'm running for president in 2020. 
uh, as a libertarian because it is your God-given right to own private property in this country. We work our entire lives for the American dream. And what is the American dream? To, to own a house, raise a family, and have what you want for your family. And anymore, a politician tells you you, you, you can work your butt off to do that, but we're gonna tax you, we're gonna regulate you, we're gonna tell you what, what numbers you have to put on the front of your house, we're gonna tell you how high your grass can be. The American dream is no longer the American dream. But the state of Oklahoma has always stood up to the fact that we have the right to farm, we have the right to own animals, and we have the right to, to harvest those animals, if, if so be, to feed our families. Well, you know, some people would say that um, a lack of laws are kind of a double-edged sword. There's people like you who love these animals and know how to care for them, and there's others who might, you know, like we talked about earlier, just want an animal or want an elephant and not know how to care for it. You know, so how do you protect animals without laws? How do we protect, protect people? Them. How do we protect kids? We're not protecting kids right now. We need to spend the, the millions of dollars that would be spent on regulating animals, regulating children, because there's a whole lot more abused children out there than there is animals. But to answer your question, um, you know, first of all, 10 years ago, we rescued more exotic animals from private owned homes, okay? We're in the 21st century now. People are twice as busy. They, they have half the funding. Uh, most people, thanks to the population explosion in, in our world, are in populated areas, which have ordinances, you know, city ordinances. You can't just own a tiger in Oklahoma City. You know, you can't just own a tiger in Edmond. Okay, so the rural areas are exactly that, rural areas for people who want to own animals and, and do things. You want to live in the city, live in the city and abide by the city law. In the state of Oklahoma, we have two private owners that are not facilities of tigers. Why would we take our, our politicians' time, resources and everything else for a law for two people? Okay, and that's a fact. Now, we have close to 15 private facilities in Oklahoma. But they're already regulated by the federal government, which is the USDA. You know, we're governed by APHIS, uh, the Animal Welfare Act. And trust me, you, you're not gonna get a game board to inspect this any tougher than the USDA does, <laughs> okay? So the regulations are there. We don't need a law, because we already have a federal law that's being paid with federal money. You know, Oklahoma can't afford to keep our schools open right now. So why would we be stupid enough to pass a law to make another agency within Oklahoma have to create this whole thing. <coughs> Ohio did that, cost them six and a half million dollars already. You know? So that would be kind of stupid. But what is pushed, every time there's a law pushed, it's pushed by who? The Humane Society of the United States. Or the Global Federation of Animal Sanctuaries, which is owned by the Humane Society of the United States, okay? Who are they? private owners that just formed an organization. Who is the Oklahoma City Zoo? Are, who's the Tulsa Zoo? They're not owned by the city. They're owned by a private, nonprofit organization. Okay, where does a nonprofit organization come from? A private owner who likes that kind of animal or that hobby. What is a sanctuary in America? Or what is a sanctuary anywhere in the world? A private owner with a hobby that likes that animal. This took that one step further, filed nonprofit for $750, and now the world pays for their hobby. Ta da! So, who is any organization to pass law upon me or you as a private citizen? Because they're just private citizens with a nonprofit status. So, how do you stop, you know, abuse of exotic animals? And well, what, if, what abuse is going on? Not none that I know of. Okay, you know, I, you know, we battle on the internet all the time. Uh, you know, petting a baby. Did you, pet, did you see any abuse today on the tour? Not that I know. Okay. 
to, according to the animal rights people on the internet, us allowing them to pet a baby tiger is abusive to that tiger. Okay, my explanation is, is how can I get those children and those people to care about a country that they will never afford to go to and help save the rainforest or help save the tigers in the wild without meeting that tiger. Everybody that leaves here today will care just a little bit more than they did when they drove in that driveway. And that's how we stop the abuse. Education and falling in love with something. Could, could you or me as a human being abuse a, a crippled little child because we met him and fell in love with him? Okay, it's the same way with animals. There's bad people in the world, I'm not gonna deny that. And there's, there's horrible people that do horrible things to animals. But we have to educate the world the difference between animal rights and animal welfare, okay? And we need to pass animal welfare laws, not animal rights.